Hello, welcome to my channel. Today we're looking at the oldest case I could find for the Jane Doe's unidentified females on the Doe Network for Oregon. And it says April 13th, 1946. And here it says estimated date of death weeks prior. But down here you'll see that it says that... Um... Huh, now I can't find it. Well, I will find it. We'll read the whole thing. It says, not recognizable. Uh, homicide, blunt force, injury to the head. But here it says weeks prior. But down there somewhere it says they had seen it for at least 30 days. So I don't know how you get weeks prior. And it gives the estimated height and weight and the age. And 30 to 59, 5'2 to 5'4, 115 to 125 pounds. And you can see the photos of her clothes. Um, brown slacks, dark blue sweater, long underclothing, black dress material and top coat. In the early morning hours of April 13th in 1946, three fishermen found the victim's fully clothed torso floating in the Williamette River. Her head, arms, and legs were sawn off. It appears that the person responsible had a knowledge of anatomy, as the cuts were neatly done. The body was then wrapped in feed sacks, tied with telephone cord, and weighted down with window sash weights. On April 14, 1946, her arms and legs were located in the river by five boatmen, approximately six miles from where the torso was found. Some of the men remember seeing the sack in the river at least 30 days earlier. On October 13, 1946, her head was recovered from William Met River in Oak Grove area. A suspect has never been identified. So, and then we're going to look at some other websites. Um, and I've been trying to do this several times today, but my computer keeps freezing up. So there's some photos, and here it shows it on the grunge, and they also have it on Wikipedia. And they had an interesting newspaper article, but it kept freezing up my computer. But I still wanted to read it and show you some of the images. And here's one of the photos from it. And it's from Oregon History, OregonLive.com. It's titled The Police Sex Scandal That Rocked 1929 Portland and Might Be Tied to a Notorious Unsolved Murder. And it's by Douglas Perry. So it's called The or or Oregonian or Oregon Live. As he pulled the car up to his house, Bill Brianning, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I don't know, Brianning spotted his former lover lingering on the front walk. The Portland police lieutenant's stomach plummeted. He knew that look on her face. Sure enough, Anna Schrader was ready for a fight. She rapidly approached the vehicle and Bruning noticed something flashing in her hand. A gun. The cop threw the car door open, hitting Schrader's arm and causing the weapon to fire into the ground. He leapt out and grappled with the woman, trying to get a hold of the pistol. As a result, the Oregonian would report in the next morning's newspaper another harmless shot was fired. The shot hardly was har harmless. The gunfire launched the biggest police scandal Portland had ever seen, ultimately ruining Bruning's career and possibly, just possibly, leading to Schrader's brutal murder and dismemberment more than a decade later. Schrader cried as she sat in a jail cell that August night in 1929, and not just because Bruning had a couple, had broken a couple of her ribber, ribs, sorry, had broken a couple of ribs when he jumped on her, her life had suddenly fallen apart. Her all-consuming love affair was over, and now she faced a charge of assault with intent to kill. She disputed Bruning's account to anyone who would listen, insisting she had the gun only because she was afraid of the burly officer. It is silly to say I wanted to kill him, she said. Had she wanted to kill the police lieutenant, she said, I could have done it with any number of times. <clears throat> I had only to let my husband come home and catch him. That's right, Schrader was married to another man and burning to another woman. But the extramarital affair wasn't the worst of it. Schrader had served for years as an informant for Bruning. And so she had become a familiar sight around the city's police stations. She was friends with other officers and had learned how the department operated. And this being 
prohibition, it operated on corruption. Many Portland cops, all the way up to Chief Leon V. Jenkins, had may have been worried about having Schrader locked up and desperate. Bruning trained her to be an informant to spy for him and trained her well, says Teresa Griffin Kennedy, co-author of the 2016 book Murder and Scandal in Prohibition Portland. It didn't take Schrader long to show her hand. She wanted Chief Jenkins to publicly exonerate her and slap down Bruning. And if the chief didn't do so, she told the press she had information that would rock Portland. For years, Ann Schrader's relationship with William Bruning had run hot even without gunfire. Bruning persuaded her relentlessly, Schrader said. He would call for me and ask me to go out to dinner and everywhere. Schrader didn't put up much resistance. Night after night, she and the police officer ended up in the little bedroom at the Schrader's Southeast Portland home, while Anna's husband, Edward, worked at a nearby rail yard. In the eight years their relationship went on, she said, Bruning rarely missed a night at my house. This was dangerous, of course, and four or five times Edward came home while Bruning was there. Each time the cop managed to escape unseen out the back because Anna had reacted quickly, throwing on a shift and intercepting her husband as he entered. The couple clearly enjoyed the adventure of it. When Edward was at home, Anna and Bruning would hole up in the downtown hotel room, or he would take her in his police car. Lieutenant Bruning, she said, told me repeatedly that he loved me better than anyone else in the world. She did have that effect on men. The small, dark-haired Anna Tierney had been married at 18 in her hometown of Medallia, Minnesota, but for reasons lost to history, soon found it necessary to leave the state of her on her own. Landing in Portland in 1910, she built a new life marrying Edward Schrader and making a name for herself as a local norms breaker as women across the country were pushing for the vote and other basic rights. She served as the secretary of the 1916 Oregon campaign for the Charles Evans Hughes, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice who faced President Woodrow Wilson in the presidential election. On Christmas Day of that year, she earned press attention by swimming in the icy Williamette River on a dare that a member of the weaker sex would do such a thing brought out a crowd. Miss Anna Schrader performed her stunt as scheduled in the afternoon, a reporter wrote. She got into the water at the foot of the Salmon Street and remained for some time. Quite an audience witnessed her performance. Then in 1921, she met Bruning and began working as an informant for him. She reportedly told the cops she was 29. She was actually 37. Prohibition was now the law of the land and millions of Americans, including police officers, flouted the new ban of alcohol beverage. Beverages. When Schrader wasn't in bed with Bruning, Wright Griffin Kennedy and J.D. Chandler in the murder and scandal, she was gathering evidence on illegal drinking for either prosecution or blackmail and participating in frame-ups and other dirty tricks. But after eight years of sex and dirty tricks, Bruning decided he'd had enough of Schrader. Maybe he'd grown weary of her demand that he leave his wife and children for her. Maybe he discovered that she'd lied to him about her age. Whatever the reason, he broke off the relationship and she didn't like it. Someone, a woman, phoned Bruning's wife and told her he was sleeping around on her. Bruning realized he had to get out in front of the situation. He met with Chief Jenkins and together they cast Schrader as an unstable woman. He said that she was infatuated with him and that she insisted on, keeping appoint on his keeping appointments with her. Jenkins later said of the meeting with Bruning, adding that the lieutenant claimed the sexual relationship was entirely in Schrader's head. This infuriated Schrader. She had believed Jenkins liked and respected her, once called her the department's angel. She knew he was aware of her affair with Bruning and had even approved of it. The former police informant who had participated in frame-ups said, It broke my heart that Bruning and the chief were trying to ruin my reputation. She feared that the department was rallying behind Bruning, lying for him, doing everything it could to put her in a bad light. It appears she was right. Bruning's colleagues reportedly swooped down on hotels where the couple had stayed and tore pages out of the registry books. When reporters asked officers about Schrader's, the response typically was, Who? Almost the whole police force knew about this affair for years, but if they were called in here, now they would know nothing, she said during a court hearing. A grand jury refused to indict Schrader for assault, but it didn't end there. Threatening countercharges against Bruning, she stayed on the front pages of the city's newspapers, which described her as a comely wife and an ex-candidate for Rose Festival Queen, though the Rose Festival has no record of her participating in the annual contest. 
I have never asked for anything but vindication from false stories, and I'm going to have it, she said outside court. Schrader promised, as one newspaper account put it, police exposure and an inside scandal. But if she had any evidence of police malfeasance, I don't know what that word is. Huh? Feasance. Malfeasance. She kept it to herself, possibly as insurance, and stuck with laying out the details of her affair with Bruning. As of November 1929, public hearing in a packed city council chamber, Schrader related the time and places that she said they were together. The Oregonian reported how she had moved from one apartment to another to be near a police box so Bruning could call in easily how they had walked through snow and cold together, how they had ridden about town and visited parks, and how they had gone to various hotels as a man and a wife. I know I've done wrong, she said. He was so nice to me in those early days, saying that he loved me, that I became infatuated with him. Surely I was mad, madly in love with him, she added. Of course I loved him. She composed herself, remembering where she was and who else was there. She asked that her husband be taken from the room before she continued. There's no use torturing him anymore, she said. He's been tortured enough. Chief Jenkins, no doubt, believed that he, too, had been tortured enough, for he knew Schrader had more secrets she could tell. Like so many police departments during Prohibition, his had been corrupted. Patrolmen took bribes from bootleggers, and the bribes went up the food chains. In some instances, the police and gangsters worked together, bringing illegal booze into the city and distributing it. On April 17, 1930, with the sex scandal still rolling, a police captain named Frank Evan wrote to Chief Jenkins after learning Schrader had a police officer who was her friend who was working in the records bureau who kept her advised as to when the police officers and other persons left the police stations carrying liquor. The confidential letter, recently unearthed from the city archives, pointed out that the department had spent weeks trying to find out who was supplying this information to Schrader. Urban closed by saying he was looking forward to the time when we will be relieved of her dirty, rotten talk and the guilty ones punished. Only Bruning and Schrader ended up being punished. Though Jenkins had initially supported the lieutenant, the bad publicity proved too much. About Schrader revealed, after Schrader revealed love notes he had written to her, Bruning was drummed out of the police department. His ex-lover's reputation also was thoroughly shredded. Schrader had prided herself on her work with the police, but those days were gone for good. Portland newspapers had spent months reporting on the scandal, but as the Great Depression took hold in 1930, they found more pressing subjects. The former police officer and his former informant returned to ordinary lives out of the spotlight. And the years that followed, Anna Schrader remained married to Edward and occasionally worked as an assistant in downtown offices. Bruning, meanwhile, declared bankruptcy and struggled to find employment. He finally managed to land a job as a security guard. Then, on April 12, 1946, two men and a woman walking along the Williamette River in Milwaukee noticed a large burlap, burlap sack bobbing in the water. They pulled it ashore, opened it, and found the torso of a woman. The head and limbs had been crudely sawed off. In the weeks that followed, more parts of the woman's body were found in the river, wrapped in newspaper and bound by wire. Portland police worked long and hard on the case, even seeking possible links to the torso murders in Cleveland that famous gang buster Elliot Ness had spent years investigating. But Portland's torso would never be identified, and no one was ever charged in the death. The now 72-year-old torso case is one of Portland's coldest, yet the answer... To it, Chandler and Griffin Kennedy realized during their research could be right there in the Oregonian. A week before the waterlogged torso was found, a classified ad in the newspaper stated, Anyone knowing whereabouts of Ann Schrader, please write N472 Oregonian. The ad ran again nine days later. In late March or early April of 1946, Anna Schrader, at that point widowed for five years, had mysteriously disappeared. The victim's vital statistics suggest that, that the torso very well could belong to the former Portland police informant. Height, weight, even bra size, they all fit. The timing of her disappearance also makes her a logical possibility. I know it's her, Griffin Kennedy says. I just know. There's one more compelling circumstantial link. Leon Jenkins returned as Portland's police chief in 1946, a dozen years after leaving the post. For all those years through the Great Depression and World War II, Schrader had kept quiet about the revelation she had once said would rock Portland. 
But Jenkins' unexpected reinstatement as chief might have angered her, making her decide to dig out her little black book and once again issue threats. Chandler and Griffin Kennedy believe. I think Bruning and Jenkins were involved in her death because she had a lot of information, Griffin Kennedy says. We almost certainly never know at this point, but it is conceivable that Schrader renewed her threats against Jenkins. After all, the only thing she'd wanted when the scandal broke in August 1929 was to be believed. She hated being portrayed as a crazy woman who had invented a police lieutenant's obsession with her. She wanted Bruning to acknowledge the affair and Jenkins to admit he knew about it. Bruning never owned up to the sexual relationship, though in the end, the court of public opinion voted against him. Jenkins, for his part, also admitted nothing. He kept his comments about Schrader brief and made clear that her personal weaknesses didn't have anything to do with him. I have known Mrs. Schrader for many years, for she has done private work for the department, Jenkins said in 1930, referring to her time as a police informant. I know nothing about her except through her operations as a detective. Sixteen years after the chief made that careful statement, Anna Schrader vanished. Despite her former association with the department, or perhaps because of it, the police did not investigate her disappearance by Douglas Perry. And here's a photo from the story. And I'm going to see if I can't scroll down and show you the letter. It says, following the charges which I have placed against Officer John Cordes for insubordination, please permit me to state to you in confidence that at the same meeting where Ann Schrader made the statement that she had a parking tag fixed, she also made a statement to the effect that she had the police officer who was her friend, that she had a police officer who was her friend, who was working in the record bureau, who kept her advice as to when police officers and other persons left the police station carrying liquor. We have been some six weeks in trying to find out who is supplying this information, and the facts are now before you, as well as the man who has been furnishing her the information. I have given information on several different occasions, and each time it led to the same officer, and if loyalty is worth anything to you for unscrupulous, disloyal men who is undetermined not only you, who is under undermining not only you, but a few of your loyal friends who are carrying on this bitter battle, looking forward to the time when we will be relieved of her dirty, rotten talk and the guilty ones punished. Yours in confidence, Frank Irwin. Letter from Captain Irwin to Chief Jenkins, courtesy of Teresa Griffin Kennedy. And here's that ad in the paper where it says, anyone knowing the whereabouts of Ann Schrader, please write North 472 Oregonian. And that's from a 1946 classified ad seeking Anna Schrader. So they didn't even investigate her disappearance. And here it talks about the Oak Grove Jane Doe. It's an unidentified murder victim found dismembered in the Williamette River, south of Portland, Oregon, near Oak Grove, over a period of several months in 1946. The first discovery consisted of a woman's torso, which was found wrapped in burlap, floating near the Wisdom Light Morge. On April 12, 1946, this led to the media to dub the case the Wisdom Light Murder. The arms and one thigh of the victim were discovered the following day, April 13th, floating against the lock system of Williamette Falls and similar burlap packaging. Both the hands and foot had been severed from the limbs and were missing. In July 1946, the second thigh was found in the Williamette near Oregon City. An additional women's clothing, believed to be that of the victim, was recovered from the Clackamas River around the same time. In October 1946, the victim's severed head was found in the river near the location of the original torso discovery. Her hands and feet were never recovered. Though, initial, though initially reported to have been a female in her late teens or 20s, a pathologist, path, pathologist from the University of Oregon Medical School confirmed the victim was a middle-aged Caucasian woman between 40 and 50 years old. The case received national media attention, appearing on the front page of numerous outlets, but her identity and killer remain unknown. In 2004, her murder case was formally reopened, but remains a cold case. The evidence, as well as the woman's remains, were lost by law enforcement 
sometime in the 1950s, rendering contemporary DNA testing impossible. They lost the evidence. How convenient. So... On April 12, 1946, three people were walking, and it just tells you the same story. And you can pause it and read it if you want to. But it, it just says, talks about the three people finding her um, south of Portland. They discovered the burlap sack and Eddie Offshore. They found the torso of a Caucasian woman with several articles of clothing, her overcoat, her underwear, her dark sweater, a uh, it had been wound with rope and wire, contained curtain sash weights. So uh, they initially thought it was a sack of drowned kittens. So they found the woman's body parts there. And it had been wound with telephone wire. So, and they had severed the hands and the arms. So they returned to the area and they kept finding different parts in different places. Police searched the area around the falls and made plaster casts of footprints found in the mud along the bank near where the arms and the leg were found. But those, they don't have any of that anymore because four years later, it all disappears. So, and there's books, you can read the books on it. And I will scroll down and you can pause this and read it if you want that too. Because this is really interesting. So, and then you can also find here on grunge.com. They also have information on it as well. And it shows a body with a toe tag. But you can pause this and read it if you like. And then I won't have a video that long, but you can still read the information that's on here. I just can't even believe that. It says, um, long union suit underwear and a grayish black tweed top coat showing signs of having been tortured with a blowtorch. So she might. And that's just horrendous. And it seems like the police might have been involved. And then later the police lost all. And with them being the police, it's easy for them to lose the evidence. So now there's no evidence of who she was. Or who committed the crime. So it's very sad. So you know who gets away with murder. That's why you, you hear, like, you have good police officers. Of course you do. But, because you have people that get the job that want to help people. But you also have people that that look for jobs like that because they want to hurt people. And if you want to hurt people and you want to commit crimes and get away with murder, that's the kind of jobs that they're going to look for. They're going to look for a job as, a, like, a police officer or maybe some kind of security guard where they carry guns and they know where cameras are and where they're not and where they can get away with committing crimes. That's just people who want children are going to get jobs at, 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 at a small church or in a school or, or a coach or something like that. That's the same thing. So, And it makes it hard for people to trust them because they know that some of these people get these kind of jobs and instead of being punished like they should be punished and kicked off the force they have this unspoken code where they want to back each other up and things like that are going to have to change and I think that it has been changing for the better because I've, I've, I've seen I've seen in places where people are being prosecuted for committing crimes even when they're police officers so I think they're changing it and I think it's getting better but you know it's been so many years and even 1940s 1950s they had this code so anyway Jane case and if you want to look at this Jane Doe case and people are trying to figure out well who is this Jane Doe well that's who they believe the Jane Doe is and it makes perfect sense to me what are your thoughts please feel free to leave comments and don't forget to stop and pray for all of the people that are involved, their family, their grandchildren, their loved ones, and everybody that it affected and scarred. And I just want to thank you so much for tuning in and have a great day. Bye-bye.